years apart, speaking moistly. Oh, what a terrible image. You're a good image. Hello! Hello! So... This is Doug. Yeah, over the week the family has grown. This is Doug. He's Hi. pretty good. Yeah, you're, for a nine you're a puppy. puppy. <laughs> and we got some messages from you saying that the Doug needed to make an appearance. Doug the dog. There you go. <laughs> he's cool. He's uh, 10 weeks now. Yeah, he's 10 weeks now. And he's still a puppy, and he's still very wiggly, and he is a smooth collie. So A tricolor smooth collie. Yeah, so he's not going to get that big mass of fur everywhere, which is awesome. <laughs> Um, and, uh, he's going to be smooth like he is right now, which is great. Um, how are you? Uh, how is everyone? Doug and I are going to go back to his cage. Doug's going to go back to his cage. Bye bye, Doug. Oh, before he unplugs the computer. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Say goodbye, Doug. Goodbye, Doug. Goodbye, Doug. Bye bye, Dougie. Okay. Lily's going to stay because she's quiet. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> okay. That's lecturing moistly. That's lecturing moistly. Oh, best song ever. Definitely a song of the year. We're still letting some people in, so we'll just kind of chat here for a minute. Uh, you know what, though? If you want, um, I will. Um, you can now annotate the answers to <laughs> um, to the uh, uh, little puzzle here. If you want, give me a second. I will just uh, release the. There you go. You can annotate away. And write down the answers. Cool. Good. Enjoy. We hope that you had a good, um, a good week. Um, we very much took advantage of the sort of downtime from Biology 1070 to catch up on, on a lot of things. Um, and of course we've been marking, um, your, uh, midterms, but you're going pretty well. You're, you're doing quite well. I'm really quite excited um, to see what the average is um, and uh, to see how you've how you've answered. We've we've finished marking like certain questions so we know a little bit about how you interpreted the question um, and um, readjusted the way that we're marking of course and those types of things so you know uh, bear with us it does take a while um, uh, because of the short answer part of it. Uh, but uh, but we're almost almost done, I think, and we'll post them as soon as they're available, of course, so that you get that feedback right away. Uh, Dashend is an impossible world word to spell. She is yes, that's good. It, I don't think it's right, but it's it's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, anyway, cool. Okay, so I see one, two, three, four, five, six circles. That's perfect. Uh, it means that you found all of them. What Fun. was the last one you found? The last one that I found. Yeah. Uh, was the mirror one that was at the top of the screen? Uh, yeah. yeah. For yeah, me, yeah. it was the tail. The tail of the cat? Yep. Yeah. Aha! Uh, okay, so let's clear this. Clear all drawings. There's the tail of the cat. Good. Um, okay, so some of you are still coming in. Um, we'll do Welcome. our best. Welcome. Okay. Um, I can work the door. Good. Okay. I can work the chair. Amazing. Um, for those of you that have participated in what we like to call the start, stop, keep <laughs> exercise, thank you so much. We've been reading your feedback. Uh, before we kind of give you a summary, though, we want to give those who haven't had the opportunity to, to write in. Uh, so we don't want to sort of tell you what other people have been saying before you, you tell us what you think kind of deal. So we'll do that on Wednesday, okay? Which is... In two days? Yeah. Because today is... Because time. Monday? And things. We're told. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I do want to... Did ad- you ask how their weekend was? Yes. And how their week was? Yes. And the answers were all good? I hope so. It's hard to get tons of feedback, but yeah. um, you can please pop stuff in the chat if you want. Uh, we're also going to be using Menti today, so if you want to open up a web browser that has www.menti.com, uh, we have two questions for you, and uh, that'll come uh, a little bit later, though. We'll remind you, of course. So, uh, What else do we have to say? Uh, we're talking about dogs here You're in the chat. We're talking about dogs in the chat. Someone else has a, um, a smooth collie. <gasps> a smooth collie. Photos yeah. must be sent, please. <laughs> um, uh, wonderful. Okay. Um, 
we uh, are very excited to see you again and to be with you again. Yeah, it was very awkward when we did this last week and no one was here. <laughs> Our children were like, why? 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 Please um, stop. Yeah. And uh, we're, uh, uh -huh. yeah, we're grateful um, to, to be back and uh, to be back with you. And so let's kind of dive in. There was some homework. Do you remember? It's possible that you're going right now. Oh, yeah. So... <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> if you've done your homework, you'll be able to answer this. If you haven't, there's no way you'll be able to answer it. It's like you had to have done your homework to answer the next question that's coming up. But I just wanted to let you know, if you did do your homework, pull out those notes or, or whatever and get them ready because we do well, have a If question. you didn't do it, there is, if you have a look at it, participate, yeah. and there is a one in four or five chance that if you just like close your eyes <laughs> and point at the screen. <laughs> yeah, there is that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we are class 12, and that's... Because yeah. 2020. Yeah, um, but because so class uh, t 10 and 11 we didn't have, right? One was Thanksgiving, one was our mental health break, uh, but we are picking it up, the ordering and the way everything is on course link, we just have to do it this way for now, or else it would require a whole revision. So, uh, so it is class 12, but there is no class 10 or 11, okay? So, so you did amazing, yeah. and the content was to die for <laughs> or something we'll figure it out yeah. we'll get the numbering all all figured out uh, because we may be a little bit off but don't worry we posted everything so if it's not there it's that it doesn't exist <laughs> and we'll we'll smooth it out um this week uh learning outcomes are here um and it just kind of builds on where we're going with everything so we talked um previously we did like an introduction to ecology and some ecology thinking and now we're going to kind of show you how you can sort of take your brain from like high level stuff in in terms of ecology and explaining biodiversity to me not blocking smith's face to teeny tiny little things and what might be important at those and, and to get you to kind of appreciate patterns. Now, if, if what we're going to do is we're going to like not tell you what the pattern is, because for those of you that are like able to follow along in synchronous lectures, you may actually capture that pattern and it will be more meaningful if you do. If you miss out or you don't, or like your three-year-old is screaming in the background and you can't focus, we will then tell you the pattern, um, which will hopefully then allow you to go back and re-experience the lecture and then kind of go, oh yeah, I see how that's connected. People right? asking where the homework was, last couple of slides of the last lecture. Yeah, you, all the homework, and we, we, we usually always yeah. assign homework, is the last couple of slides of, of the last lectures, of the, the previous lecture. So this is our... Previously on Homeland. <laughs> so the homework was to calculate the different uh, indices for the, the three woodlots, um, the three smaller woodlots uh, that we've given you, the sort of pictographed icon woodlots, not the actual the, ones. They are literally those shapes, though. I, I trace those shapes. Those are GIS shapes. Yay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so just to add to the je ne sais quoi. Of it, the, the virtualness of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. And so if you've done the homework, here's your question. Uh, I'll set up, I'll call out the poll. There you go. I'll give you a couple minutes. So you either will get it or you won't. So you don't, don't start now you're so, madly calculating. You're so, you're so stark. I know, morning. I know, but like, don't, don't. Worry. March 191st, and now all of the, everything's stark. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> Which stark would you be? I think you're Ariel. Thank you. <laughs> Careful, Smith. <laughs> You know your, your answer you, will determine your happiness for you, the next two weeks. You, you know nothing, Alex Smith. <laughs> Could I be Jon Snow? No, because you're He's Arya. not a Stark. Well, <laughs> he kind of is. If you follow the paternal like, naming. Yeah. yeah. Oh, spoiler alert. I see a clear favorite. A clear favorite. Yeah, okay. And thank you for uh, your honesty.
Mm-hmm. Game of Thrones is the best. Yes. The book. Yes. And one of my favorite cartoons is the one that starts out how the Game of Thrones TV series started and it's this intricate hind yeah. end quarters of a horse and then how it ends and it's like <laughs> 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 Never rush ahead of the author. Okay. Um, so uh, please just feel free to, to click in there. Um, uh, and uh, give us the feedback. If you didn't do the homework, please let us know. Um, what I will say, though, is um, maybe now reflecting back on your experience at the midterm, the homework is basically like the giant Easter egg uh, for what's going to come up on the midterm. Uh, pretty much ev- uh, there's, there's nothing that we do to waste your time. Um, and so if you can't do the homework, you know, kind of following along with the weeks, please make sure that you do it and dive in. And we'll show you how to dive in uh, a little bit with this question. So for example, um, you know, take a look at, uh, we'll show you which one is the correct answer, but take a look at the the not correct answers and go, hmm, let's see what happens if we do that. Um, You know, if we double the number of individuals in the dairy bush, does it change the alpha? Does it change the Shannon diversity index? That kind of deal. Like just kind of, you know, dive into some of these questions, right? Um, for D, both Dairy Bush and North Campus Ravine have the same Shannon Diversity Index. What does that mean if they have the same one? How do I get them to have the same one if they don't? Um, you know, that kind of deal. So, so it's really designed to, to kind of dive in um, and play around with the numbers and that kind of deal. Um, and uh, we will ask you, um, now, now that we can, um, we will ask you to uh, use that online calculator, for example, for the Shannon Diversity Index for the exam, uh, and to go and calculate some things potentially. You never have to memorize the equation. You can no. always Google that. I Google it all the time. But you use those numbers, and so we will ask you to do that for, for the midterm. And so this homework question is a particularly meaty one. Uh, as far as prep for the midterm, but also prep for critical thinking, you know, how, why, you know, what, what are the limitations of each of these? Um, what are the implications if you make decisions based on them? Uh, that kind of deal. So, so there you go. I'm going to end the polling right now and I'm going to share the results with you. So just go and take a look. Uh, you can see that most of you have, have still to catch up. It's totally fine. Just make sure that you do. Okay. Um, and uh, the correct answer is B. So the ones of you who did do the homework, um, then uh, you've got the correct answer there. Um, and those of you who said something else, uh, either either you were guessing, which is totally fine, but if, if you did think that that was the correct answer based on your calculations, go back and take a look. Um, and if you need any help, please feel free to, to hang out after class and we can, we can talk about all of those things. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, somebody had asked a question about the identity of one of the tree species, and I oh. thought we had a legend for those things in the last lecture, but I'm just looking for it. Okay, so Smith is so. following up on the chat for you, um, and I hope we can move on. Is oh, yeah, please move yeah? on. Okay. Yeah. Moving on. Moving on! Good, okay. So, what we need you to do is take a deep breath. <gasps> Because we're going to like zoom out. We've been focusing a lot on the woodlots and those are teeny tiny places. And now we're going to zoom out and focus like on the entire planet. Can I let my breath out? Yes, you can breathe. Okay. (laughs) Because what we want to do is we want to get you to think about biodiversity and what factors are important, what variables are meaningful at different geographic scales, right? So a biome is different than a regional scale or a local scale. And what we want you to do is to appreciate that the things that are driving or explaining the biodiversity differences across those scales are different. Um, and it's kind of cool. So, so we want to kind of walk you through that process. So it's a new word. We've talked a little bit about it when we're talking about biological levels of organization. So it's not brand new. It's no. the word at the top, right? Um, and hopefully they won't put on any more. But like if we discover more planets and there is more biodiversity on these planets, then like planetary would be at the top of that one. Okay. <laughs> right now, as of the world today in 2020, who knows? <laughs> you can't get bigger than a biome when we're talking about biodiversity. Okay. Is that fair? 
That's fair. Okay. You can get you can subdivide it. If you go and work for the Ontario Ministry, you'll run into things called eco zones and eco districts and eco opportunities and eco and they there are, are bigger than biomes. No, they're but okay. they're they're within and they're the top end of them is very um it's it's kind of right up nudged up against it. So eco so, opportunity kind of caught my attention. Yeah, I don't know. It kind of scared me a little bit, but also kind of inspired me. Yeah. Like, so anyhow, so okay. so these terms and this subdividing, this large scale subdivision of, of ecosystems uh, is something that you will run into if you end up um, being employed or having a, a, a career as a biologist, particularly at a ministry level, ministerial level. Cool. Okay. So first things first, we would like you to, this is just like a brain dump, go to www.menti.com and we would like you uh, to write out the factors, the variables that you think are relevant to explaining the diversity that exists across biomes. Okay? Biomes. And what I'll do is I'll go back and you can take a look at some of the biomes, right? The code is 76798354. So what factors help explain the difference in biodiversity across biomes? And if we go back, here are some biomes, okay? Don't do the activity at the bottom there. This is just right now for you to go, okay, what could explain the difference between the green and the blue? Uh, we can see it start to fill here. It's, uh, it's gorgeous. Well done so far. Just keep on going. Somebody's asked in the chat if this is recording. Yes, the lectures are always recorded. Yeah. And so what you should see in the lecture is just us. You will see eventually is the slides and us, not any of your uh, faces. Yes. And it will be put on course link uh, via via the YouTube. <laughs> We're YouTubing it. <laughs> yes. Okay. This is fabulous. Thank you so much. I want this as a wall hanging. Yeah, it's very well done. Very well done. You 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 understood exactly what we were trying to communicate, which is not always easy. Language is precise. <laughs> okay. Um, let me share with you what you have been answering because it is genius. <laughs> which is an in joke in our house. Yes, our son is convinced that he is a genius. When okay. he, like, does anything. doesn't spill the milk. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very I'm pri a, privileged I'm a, definition I'm of genius. I'm a genius. <laughs> I'm a genius, yeah. Okay, so here's what you've got, and it is, for the most part, completely accurate. Um, and uh, take a look at sort of the distribution of things. Obviously, climate is going to be the biggest one, right? Um, uh, is the one that most of you have said. So temperature, you've also said a lot. Um, I love abiotic factors. I love abiotic factors. He loves factors. abiotic factors. All the tingly. That is freaking brilliant. Well and done. it came up a number of times. So yay. Um, uh, altitude uh, is good, but Smith will want to correct that. It's a fun thing. So if you are a biologist studying abiotic factors, you are only interested in altitude if you're in an airplane because uh, al altitude is when you're not touching the ground. Elevation is when you're touching the ground. And so if, if altitude is a problem, it means your plane needs to pull up because otherwise <laughs> you're going to tell into... What Elevation. Was the, what was the soccer, uh, Argentinian soccer players in the... Alive? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise yeah, it's yeah, a tasty, yeah. tasty, tasty several weeks. Yeah. If you're in a plane and altitude meets elevation, you have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> More than a macroecological yeah. one. Okay. Uh, weather, geography, landforms, lovely, lovely, lovely. All of these can be summarized by abiotic factors, right? Okay. So keep that in mind, please. It's, it's brilliant. Okay. Now this was kind of a big thing. In the latter part of the 20th century from say 56 60 to 70s 80s and even now the fact that such coherence could be mapped at a global scale because of a fairly simple set of things so, so this we're, we're excited by this 
And we're excited to where for where it ends because it, it's not like the one ring. It's not like yeah. this is going to explain all the things. But <laughs> holy smokes, it, it explains a lot does. of things. Yeah. Okay. So My Google precious. stuff, please. Go on to Google. Open up a web browser. Type in where you are and then biome and see what you get. <laughs> and if you're using Bing, shake your head. Yeah. And I'll launch a, a Zoom polling question at you. It's a kind of a two-part question because we couldn't put all of the biomes into one uh, question, so you'll see, and we'll, if it doesn't work, we'll get you to like, yeah, click or annotate or something. But don't don't do that yet. Um, let me throw the question at you, and we'll see if it works. So if you don't see your biome there, scroll down to the next question, <laughs> and hopefully it'll. Uh, I always thought Tropical Thorn Forest should be the name of a band. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I am For some reason, I, I imagine them as uh, appearing at like Lilith Fair in the 90s with Sarah <laughs> McLaughlin and Wild Strawberries. And, and they're wearing yeah. like thorn yeah. crowns. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next up, Tropical Thorn Forest. <laughs> cool. And they come. Yeah, Tropical Thorn Forest, the one where you're bleeding. How do you know you're there? You're bleeding. You're bleeding. All the time. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. So for those of you who have already answered, wonderful. Thank you. Take a look at this map because it is awesome yeah. and will probably show up on the final like or on the midterm. So get you to just like... What can you predict that's, based on these maps? Yeah, and that's not even an Easter egg. That's like a straight... Like, this map will be on the next midterm. Yes. And it will not be, like, label all no. of the bi... No. But, like, what hypotheses can you make about, like, the distribution or the, you know, genetic isolation of things that live here or there or whatever? Like, trying to integrate all of this stuff into this map that is so rich with information. Yeah, somebody's saying temperate rainforest, question mark, and I that might be... Is that something that's missing or no, it's something that is there asking if it's a thing and it's definitely it's a thing. It's definitely a thing, yeah. right? Vancouver After the, uh, Island has temperate rainforests. It's chilly, like literally, like emotionally and, and like literally. bone, bone chilling. <laughs> okay, so we're going to end it uh, just to be able to move on. But you can see, so what I can see, this worked super well. So nobody is in the tropical thorn forest. Amazing. <laughs> uh, some of you are in the tropical evergreen or the tropical deciduous, which is probably beautiful, and I hope it's beautiful wherever you are. Somebody said hot desert. Amazing. I am fascinated by deserts. I'm interested in the high mountains. Um, and uh, the high mountains, one or two, two of you, um, most of us are in the temperate deciduous, which means most of us are probably here, but you could also be like anywhere across uh, Russia. Uh, or Northern Europe, beautiful. Um, my okay, my bio was in the previous. Okay, perfect. Yay, good. So there you go. We'll share the results so you can take a look. Um, and let's talk a little bit about this. So here is here are the answers. If uh, if you got it right, I'm sure you could just look outside and go. I don't live in a hot desert, <laughs> uh, but uh, but it's kind of cool uh, the patterns and and the things that explain uh, the diversity and the reason for these blotches being where they are. Okay. What we want you to do is hold off just one second because we're going to ask you to annotate stuff. But wait, okay? I'll go back here because it turns out. That most of these things, and this is one of the elegant, some, um, there's different ways scientists have of saying simple. One of the code words for simple is elegant. One of the elegant parts of the this macroecological hypothesis is that really you only need two factors to explain these uh, spaces and these uh, shapes on the map. One of them is temperature and one of them is precipitation. They can both be measured in a number of ways, but generally if you want right now, elegantly imagine them as the mean annual temperature and the total annual precipitation. And if you can plot those two things, and 
anywhere you're sitting, pretty much anywhere in the world right now, you can yeah. if you chose to. So you can predict the position and the and the shape of that that prediction space will then tell you about where you are in the world. I get chills. That's lovely. That's so elegant. Elegant, right? So basically, we can take all of your contributions to, to Menti, the ones that do actually uh, explain biodiversity across biomes, and collapse it down to two words. This mind map can be broken down into two things, temperature and precipitation, right? And, and in fact, a lot of what you've contributed is... Is falls literally, within there. So is climate that. is yep. temperature and precipitation. Yeah, and those of you who said elevation slash altitude, those actually break down because of that. When you latitude, said when you said longitude, latitude, that's yeah. that's essentially Geography, another way of describing yeah. that. So the ones that kind of that that are incorrect at this at this stage are all of the biotic things that are in this yeah. contribution. Vegetation, for example, that is a little bit later, right? But at the biome level. Uh, it is all abiotic factors that that characterize or just you know can distinguish the difference in biodiversity uh, patterns, um, and they are abiotic factors. Okay, that's kind of key. Ah, so okay, hold off on your stamps. We're gonna clear, and what I'd like you to do, if if you don't mind, is pick a red stamp. And we're going to now, now that we've understand that it's two factors, temperature along the horizontal axis and precipitation along uh, the vertical axis, select a red stamp, please. And what I'd like you to and do hold it above the is <laughs> just get it ready. And when I say three, then stamp. But on, let me tell you where to stamp. On three? On three. Or after three. Not after three. Okay. On three. Okay. So just hold off. What, what I want you to do is to put your mouse over where the tropical biome may appear in this, um, in this graph, okay? So the tropical one, just hover over it in, with a red stamp. Temperature going from low to high, precipitation, there we go. Oh, okay, super. one, two, three, go. <laughs> Good. I love it. Okay, and then as you're, as you're waiting, um, we're not going to do boreal next because I want you to wait. Uh, pick a blue stamp and get ready. Tropical for I'm trying to screen grab these. Okay. Pick a blue stamp and we'll just kind of wait. And shall I clear? Uh, no? We're going to change the colors. We're going to change the colors. Sorry, got it. So it'll be like this like rainbow. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are ready with your blue stamps, I would like you to click on where you think a hot desert would be on this particular figure. In blue, please. Blue, blue. Very good. Blue. Excellent. Okay. And then uh, prepare a green stamp, please. And we're going to go with the savanna, please. Green for savanna. This is so fun. <laughs> oh. So green where you think savanna is. I do see you drinking your coffee. I'm drinking my coffee. Excellent. There we go. Very good. Okay. And you know what? One of the things I like about this annotation tool is that it is, um, you're filling a space because there isn't one precise space in this yeah. matrix that is going to be, well, yes, that's yes. it. And all the other areas are no. It's like, no, there's a... That's lovely. Okay. Well done. That's great. And we can fill in all of the others for sure. So if you want to use um, purple for uh, the boreal, that would be good. And uh, maybe orange for temperate. Go ahead and fill those in. Purple for boreal and orange for temperate. So they're not seeing the stamp show up either, but they are. So we're going to make sure, I think, 
I think our stamping activity might have frozen. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. But you see us moving? Do you see us moving? Can you hear us? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. So this is recording, and so you'll see it. It's just a, a slow internet connection that's making it a little bit challenging. So if everybody could now stop annotating, and then the internet bandwidth will catch up, that would be great. So just stop annotating. Um, in fact, you know what? Maybe I'll I'll force it to stop. Encourage strongly. Encourage strongly. I like that. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm trying. It's very slow. Yeah. Hooray! Yay! Okay. Trying to. Try to. It, it, it won't. It's yeah. like just catching up. Yeah. 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 So this is. Good. Oh! Ho! Yay! <laughs> Stop! <laughs> okay, cool. Great. So, um, if uh, you, you want um, maybe a little bit more or like organization to this very messy, messy graph, uh, here's your organization for those of you that, uh, <laughs> that need it to be all compact. Um, and basically, you've done it um, exactly, exactly right. Um, so uh, here are the different biomes relative to the two variables. And the elegance of it is delightful in that, you know, all of the sort of differences in biodiversity can be explained by these two factors. So abiotic factors at the level of biome. And of course, as we go down, things get kind of messy, right? That's where the beauty of biology comes into place, right? So here uh, are the corresponding uh, letters. Um, but you that, see, uh, and like we were saying earlier, they, though, that's where we've kind of placed the letters. You could argue with this a little bit about the exact, like should it be a little bit higher, a little bit lower? And our answer would be, it depends yeah. what place you're imagining. Yeah. Each there will be an answer for each place on the world. That's the elegance of it, and then the specifics of it. Is, it will depend on yeah. the specifics of where you're imagining. Exactly. Imagine, imagine. Yay. Okay. So species diversity is definitely affected by temperature and precipitation by the abiotic factors. And you know this. You know this intuitively. Yeah. So. Thinking about, you know, what does it mean and what are some of these patterns and how is it all explained? There is this sort of hypothesis or this, you know, observation that can be broken in many ways, right? There are wonderful exceptions and it's actually the exceptions that kind of highlight or focus our attention as biologists, right? So, so this is what I'm going to say now is kind of like an idea, a global pattern. Right. And I want you to think about the exceptions because that will help sort of strengthen the rule, hopefully. But the rule goes something like this. <laughs> what? Uh, it reminds somebody of Zootopia, which is lovely. Yay. Because our kids love that movie. We, <laughs> we, we sing the sh we Shakira the we morning Shakira away. a lot. Yeah. 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 Um, OK. So here's the rule that as you go from the equator, which is latitude zero, right? to the poles, both the north and the south. So that's increasing latitude in both directions, right? So from zero to 90 north or zero to 90 south. Um, biodiversity, so the number of species decreases, but population size increases. So just kind of think about that for a second. And I've tried to capture it with these smiley faces, <laughs> where a smiley face represents <laughs> along the equator a different species, and uh, at the poles, um, different species by color and many, many, many individuals. And it's a huge trend, right? Yeah. That is mostly true, right? If you think about the number of species on one branch in a Costa Rican rainforest, it far out exceeds the number of species that are in the entire, you know, Antarctic. Right? Um, Hold on, I'm still thinking about that branch. 
I miss, still think he's, I he's like, he's lost. Intensive. We've lost him on the branch. Okay, so Costa Rica branch, way more biodiverse than all of Antarctica. Okay, there's one fly in Antarctica. That's it. There are two vascular plants, two grasses. That's it, right? There are 24 species of birds in Antarctica. That's it. There are millions of those penguins or of those birds in vast numbers that are mind-boggling, right? Standing on one of these rookeries, the noise will deafen you. The smell will, like, stay also with you for you. years. When I used to come home, my mom used to make me, like, like, I'd come home from the airport with all of my gear. She'd make me put it on the driveway and hose it down because I smelled so bad, right? It is unbelievable, the, the population sizes. And of course, on that one branch in Costa Rica, you have not that many individuals, right? Not in the millions and millions that so, you would see. So many species, few yeah. indi fewer individuals of each one of those species yeah. on average. One of the things about these graphs, these amazing graphs, there's a couple of questions that in the, in the chat. One of them is, what about when you run into the ocean? And it's like, so these trends are for terrestrial, terrestrial. things across the terrestrial environment. Um, and they generally hold true for most of the, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into the differences between marine and terrestrial in a second. But what I wanted to say about the latitude was those straight lines. Remember those apps like square brackets, absolute latitude. So yes, if you plotted it as negative to positive with zero in the center, it would, it would actually be like a, like a bell curve, like we saw with those uh, normal distributions in the first unit. Exactly. Thank you for that. That's important. Okay. So, so it's kind of it's kind of cool. And think about why. What's going on in the in the north and the south relative to to the equator? What is driving that big global pattern? There's an idea okay. in the chat. There's an idea. Is it because of competition? <laughs> Totally. Oh my goodness. Yes. So absolutely because of competition. Absolutely because I love the other one. Tons and tons and tons of krill. You're totally right. Yes, because krill and, and that happens like in the marine system as well. The number of Antarctic krill individuals, huge. The number of species in the Antarctic, probably only about six or seven. Number of krill species in more temperate areas, Definitely uh, bigger, but population sizes are smaller. Some right? great further ideas. There's there's one about a hypothesis about harsh, the harshness of the abiotic conditions, uh, harsh precipitation and temperature, great. resulting in, in that only certain species are able to survive there. Yes. And so then natural selection only has those species to work with. Yes. And so you have less variability and then less competition. With the implicit part of that being that there's less competition or there's maybe somehow a difference to figure out intra versus inter-specific competition. That's right. Is it because species find a niche and speciate faster? These are like whole branches of macroecology. You can, you can follow people. There's a, um, if you know the singer James Brown, there's also an ecologist James Brown, um, who, who works on temperature causing all of the things. And one of them is, is related to the rates of speciation. So there's evidence. It's not entirely it, but these are all amazing hypotheses. Totally, totally accurate. Yes. And testable. You figured it out. It's awesome. Yeah. Well done. We don't even need to say it again. Okay, you see you. <laughs> done. <laughs> okay, really good. So questions to think about for the exam and also for life um, is, uh, are these trends real? Where are the exceptions? Okay, think about I that. love the exceptions. Do they apply to all types of organisms or have we introduced like a vertebrate bias, for example, right? Or an endotherm bi bias? So short answer, we yes. always do. <laughs> we always do. But what can that tell us about the biology of those things that break this rule? And that's really what ecology is. These big rules that are frequently broken, that give us insight into, you know, certain mechanisms of evolution or certain, you know, interesting features about that local area or that region, right? And that's, I think, one of the lovely parts, one of the attractive parts about ecology to me, not a frustrating part, but an attractive part is that it... There's value in the rules when they work, and there's value in the rules when they're broken. Thank and they're, they're slightly different values, but they're <laughs> they're amazing. Yeah. You don't, I mean, this is part of science. You don't throw out a rule when it's broken. You're like, oh, 
Hmm. Yeah. Why? Why? And 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 that's kind of the the mark of a creative scientist, right? Is is one who can uh, devise an experiment and hypotheses whereby no matter what the answer is, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and that's really like what you want to do where you go, hey, it doesn't matter what I find, what I find is going to be interesting, right? Okay. So um, we are kind of going to zoom in a little bit um, because we've kind of set the stage for the big global patterns of biomes. Uh, and now we want you to think a little bit about um, what might be driving <coughs> some of the um, patterns that we see at more local scales. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so looking at the regional scale, why are there different types of trees in southern versus northern Ontario? Why is the biodiversity different across this smaller, not global scale? Um, so this brings us back to our big maple tree. Um, oh, the pelham. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So why is it here? <laughs> How did it get here? And what might we, we, what, what might we be able to use to explain it? And more importantly, what hypotheses can we test, right? So what are the different possibilities <coughs> and how can we test them? There are lots of possibilities, um, and regional patterns are often determined by dispersal mechanisms. And there's lots of different ways that plants... Re regional patterns spatially and short-term patterns temporally are, are all about how things move, how they're able to move, how they're unable to move. So this can involve moving, like you're picturing caribou moving across the tundra, yes, eggs and seeds, uh, being moved downstream like those are the mussels floating downstream or not if they're in still water or a moving stream. Larva, juveniles, whether it's assisted by water, wind assisted, animal assisted, all great examples. Those are some lovely hooks, some barbs in that slide down there. Um, hitchhikers and burrs and thorns. All of that's important. Now we have a, a an aside here about this um, ecologist, super important ecologist that I'm going to guess on average, and you can tell me in the chat if, if I'm wrong, you probably haven't heard of. And this is Margaret B. Davis, who is uh, a Minnesota, a re now retired ecologist, who is super important to the field of paleontology and in ecology in general. And she was one of the first people to use pollen. Uh, cores of pollen that she took out of the substrate, often from lake bottoms or bogs, to look at the post-glacial history of recolonization of trees. And so we're going to talk about a specific example, but I want to show her face because of the importance of her to ecology. Late in her career, she was recognized as an important ecologist. She was the president of the Ecological Society of America, which is like a, it says America, but it's like a global organization. And she won um, an eminent ecologist award. Earlier in, in her career, she was, uh, I'll t there's a slide in a second, I'll tell you about it. But earlier in her career, she, it was, things was, things were hard. So what you've got here are two scanning electron microscopes of uh, hemlock, Tsuga canadensis, and a species of maple, Acer spa spa. <laughs> um, so gorgeous. One of the things that you'll learn if you go into seeing things under scanning electron microscopes is, oh my God, you want to look at all the things, all the detail, really small. So two different species. Important to look at there. Look at the scale. One of them, the bottom, really small. One of them, they're both really small, but one of them is much smaller, like an order of magnitude smaller than the other. This is results to the next slide, to differences in how those species have recolonized. Oh, I, here's my spiel about her. Um, she, lots of discrimination. There's links if you, when you get these slides later on, you can click on these things. So, Good. so this first all with the small example. So maple kind of sp starting post-glacially recolonizing North America once the kind of kilometers of ice is, is gone and there's a space for trees and plants to live. That maple spread north and east from the southwestern parts of its range. And you can see where she's mapped out, it's kind of 6,000 years ago, they reached that part of the upper reaches of the St. Lawrence River. About 10,000 years ago, they started getting into the lower parts of the Great Lake by Lake Erie. That's the small wind-dispersed um, acer seeds, now or pollen, excuse me. Now the next one with Suga, you can see those numbers, a similar geographical pattern. Post-glacially, they were still in the south and the east. But as they, the bigger uh, pollen, 
has taken longer to reach the same points on average. Amazing. Like that's that's lovely. So, yeah. how why is the Pelham tree there, and why isn't it somewhere else? Some part of that answer has to do with the dispersal capacity of that species. So, in contributing to this big pattern that we want your brain to kind of like, right? Biomes, everything that explains biodiversity at the biome level is abiotic. As you move down into regional and then local, things get more biotic y, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there are more reasons that are related specifically to the organisms that are already there, right? And their biology. And the intersection is really interesting. It's so interesting, and, right? And, because the wind yeah. is abiotic. And the biology is biotic, right? Like the size of the grains uh, or of the pollen grains. Um, so now it's like there's this beautiful like intermixing, right? And we're going to cancel out the abiotic by going to the next level. But first, here are some more really cool examples of ways that you can actually measure these things at the regional scale. These differences in the dispersal can happen, you know, through like geological time, um, as well as um, uh, by looking like now in sort of contemporary conditions to see how things have changed. Is that, am I remembering correctly, is that photo involved Dr. Nick Bernier, who's one of the faculty members? You know, it very, very when much, yeah, when, when, when he was a hippie. When bell <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Local scale, right? Zoom, zoom, zoom. So local means, you know, why don't all three campus woodlots have exactly the same species, right? And I hope that you're starting to think about what might be driving those differences because um, we've got uh, another Menti question for you. So just go back to uh, Menti. It's the same code. Uh, and start thinking and I will set this up so that you can start telling us what you think can be uh, can be used to explain uh, why the woodlots have different biodiversity. Nice. Thank you. Very, very good. Oh, I like seeing some of these. Edges. Yeah, well done. Yeah. You're doing great. You're doing great. We'll just I'm, leave it up for another minute. Um, I'm working very hard not to say the words out loud. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Super good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, super. Uh, you've done you've done really really well. Um, so taking a look at um, at the screen, um, I see abiotic factors as being a prominent one, but I would encourage you to kind of try to shift your brain away from the abiotic factors because there aren't many that would explain the difference in the woodlots. I see though biotic factors that are there: competition, human activity. Um, invasive species, edge effects, uh, human intervention, plantations, uh, vegetation, soil quality, absolutely. All of these things can vary on a small scale. Things like average temperature or precipitation um, aren't going to vary from Browns Woods to the dairy bush. They're like, you know, 500 meters away from each other. Um, and so those sort of large scale abiotic factors are not going to. If there was like a big rocky outcrop in one of them, then that is an abiotic factor that may. Um, but most of the abiotic factors aren't going to vary all that much. And again, with the intersection. So that's in comparing between a forest and a forest. The yeah. abiotic factor is not mattering that much at the small scale. Yeah. Still at a small scale, the difference between the forest and the field yeah. The abiotic factors can vary tremendously, yeah. and that then can drive 
the difference between the two things. So, so it's the, there's there's an intersection. But keep it in your head in general. At the large scale, the primacy of the abiotic factors, and at small at the small scale, the the greater importance of the of the biotic factors. Is that cool? Okay, you're totally right. And I because I presented a you know large animal vertebrate bias or large species like trees, and this guy's going, but what about the ants, yeah. right? And that that to me is fascinating, right? What about the ants? What about the bacteria? What about the nematodes and all of those things? Um, they kind of break the rule in many respects, so they're at a much smaller scale. They cause you to change the scale of the rule. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Love, and I love that as an answer it's too. Awesome, which means there's so much to study, yeah. right? And it's just really important to know where you are in the where your brain is working in that context, right? And, and to kind of try, like in a lot of things, identify your bias. Yeah. And go like, okay, well, we we say often this is how I see the world, and it's like, well, that's in just in itself. Meaning to see is to understand. That's a bias. Yeah. Most of the world smells and tastes. Seeing not so important. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Homework before Aha. we say goodbye. Oh, yeah. Um. Uh. Make a list of all of the biological levels of organization and include at least three variables that you can think of. Now, they, they may overlap, they may repeat, no problem, but at least three variables that can help describe diversity or variation at that level that can help account for it, right? What are some of the driving factors? Um, and hopefully that'll help you kind of like open up your brain and see some patterns uh, to be able to um, to understand what the large scale um, what the large scale message is. And um, with that, we hope you've enjoyed today. We have. We have. That was fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, we'll just shut down for a minute, uh, and then we'll open it up if you want to stick around and ask questions or chat. Uh, we've got the next hour for you. And you've seen already some of you. Dr. R is here as Yay, well. And Dr. So there R is can in be, the house. Uh, there can be questions for any of us. Wonderful. Okay. We'll see you in a minute. Wave like a Muppet. We're turning Bye. off soon.